think we're good. Everybody, everybody can hear me? Okay. All right, well, good morning. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Good to see you. Um, I'm going to start with the word of prayer for us before we begin. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful and blessed to be here today and to gather, Father, and be able to uh, do our lesson study today, Father, in, uh, in this lesson study concerning the Sabbath. And uh, we just pray this morning, Father, that your Holy Spirit will be present and dwell amongst us, Father. And uh, I ask today that my words not be spoken, but your words through me, Father. And I pray that uh, each and every one of us will be blessed by this study this morning. And I ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, so the lesson title for Lesson 11 this week is Waging Love. Great title, I thought, Waging Love. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with the memory text as usual. And uh, it's found in Isaiah 58, verse 10. So today our study is in Isaiah 58, mainly. Um, it reads, If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dine, uh, excuse me, dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as the noonday. Okay, so uh, Sabbath lesson study... I'm just going to go ahead and read it as usual. I can just talk about it, but I think it's easier just to read through it. Uh, Jewish cantor, worshiper leader is what a Jewish cantor is, and his wife, who lived in Lincoln, Nebraska, began receiving threatening and obscene phone calls. They discovered the calls came from a leader of an American hate group, the Ku Klux Klan. Knowing his identity, they could have turned, to him, in, they could have turned him into the police, but they decided on a more radical approach. When they learned that he was crippled, they showed up at his door with dinner. He was utterly flabbergasted. His hatred melted before their love. The couple kept visiting him, and the friendship grew. He even thought of becoming Jewish. Is this not the fast that I, have, that I chose to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free? And to break every yoke, is it not to share your bread with the hungry? Isaiah 58, verse 6 and 7. Um, so ironically, it says the couple in Lincoln kept such a fast by sharing their feast with a hungry oppressor, thereby setting him free from his own bonds of injustice, or unjust, excuse me, prejudice. Uh, good story, I thought. So kind of turned the whole situ situation around from somebody that was full of hate into melting his heart by just doing a kind act. You know, bringing food to somebody. How awesome is that? I mean, showing kindness. Uh. So we're going to see today what uh, this really is about, uh, what this, this Sabbath fast, because I believe that's kind of the focal point of this, this whole lesson study today. And uh, there's a lot to be said about it. Um, Okay, so Sunday's lesson, we're just going to dive right into it. Uh, and the heading is Buy Something Free. Kind of sounds uh, contradictory, right? We could call it oxymoron. Yeah, yeah, I guess we could call it an oxymoron, right? <coughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. How can you buy something if it's free? Well, let's find out. Uh, so, uh, when we start in Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 7, um, it just tells us the beginning of the chapter here, so uh, I think maybe I should just, I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read it. I'm going to read through it, and then we're going to go ahead and talk about it. So verse, starting at verse 1, Isaiah 55, if you guys want to follow along, um, it reads, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your, your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader, a commander for the people, Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord 
while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Um, there's three themes that are actually going on in, in those verses there. And if we, if we were to look at them a little bit closer, uh, we would see that, number one, there's mercy for everyone. Okay, and of course we know, I, I think we're familiar with what's going on to the time period and what's happening here in these verses. Hopefully, if not, we'll talk more about it. So the second thing that we see here also is the way to get true life. The way to get true life. And we know that that only comes through Christ Jesus, right? Um, and number three is God calling us for a return or calling the people at that time for a return to him. Okay, so those are the three things that we're looking at there. Um, so the question asked is, when we read this text, um, is what contradiction do we see there? Well, we saw the contradiction that it's saying buy, but it's buy something that's already free, right? Which is really interesting. Um, so I'm just going to look at the memory or the uh, the text here and uh, just read through it briefly. It says, uh, "Suppose you took food and stood on the street in a big city and announced to the hungry and the homeless there." You who have no money, come and buy and eat. But how can they buy if they have no money? However, if you added the words, as Isaiah did, without money, without price, right? The point becomes clearer. Isaiah appeals to the people to accept forgiveness. So that's really what we're looking at here. I mean, when we read this in a spiritual sense, we get a whole different idea of what's really being said, right? Because when we really... We, when we read it in the literal sense, it's kind of like it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But if we put it to what God is saying to us spiritually, what is it that he's trying to give us that, number one, we can't purchase, and number two, if we can't purchase it, then how can we get it? Any takers? Go ahead, brother. Sounds good to me. Sounds about right. Yes. Go ahead, sister. Oh, go ahead.
Yeah, thank you for your comment, sister. Um, yeah, no, it's true. Um, the two basic necessities in life is what? That we need, I mean, really, we don't need everything else to survive except bread and water, right? Those two basic things. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, when he says, uh, everyone who thirsts come to the waters, so yeah, when Jesus said he was the living waters, right? So he's, he's given us a call to come to him, right? Because he's the provider of everything. He's the one that supplies it all to begin with. Um, so yeah, it is, a, it is an appeal to accept forgiveness is what this is saying. Um, and we know, as the, as the lesson tells us too, I mean, we know that uh, it, it, it really isn't free because there was a great price that had to be paid for that, right? for that salvation, for that forgiveness, for that pardon. Um, you know, in every case, when we think of these things, think of them always as a court case. You know, we are on trial. We have a death sentence, right? And Jesus is willing, God is willing, God the Father is willing to pardon us, but only through the sacrifice that was made through his son, right? Uh, yeah, go ahead, sister. Good point. It's kind of like the law of reciprocity, right? Like, you, if what you do or what has been done is what you have to do and vice versa, is what God is asking us. He gave his life selflessly, and he expects us to do the same, is to be selfless and giving. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, if I could, can I uh, follow up on this? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well put. Thank you, brother. Uh, yeah. And some of the texts, uh, Matthew ten thirty nine is the one that really stands out a lot to me. It says, "He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it." So yeah, is there a price that God is asking us to pay? Yes. But by no means is that payment 
a way to earn salvation because we could never earn something that is free in the first place. Um, yeah, and there's a few more scriptures. Let me just read another one. Uh, Luke 9, 23, take up the cross and follow him. Uh, it says, uh, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Um, and this is really what we're looking at with this whole lesson study today. We're going to talk more about it as we get into the other day's lesson studies. Um, I like what uh, Philippians 3.8 says also. It says, Yes, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And we know that Paul suffered many things for the sake of Christ. Um, okay, so the, qu the next question was, what was the price for our salvation? Uh, First Peter 1.18, uh, if somebody would like to read that. And, and they actually gave us the scripture, but they didn't give us the next one after it is what we're really, uh, is what we're looking at. Uh, so First Peter 1, verse 18 and 19, I think 20 is the one we really want to look at. Any takers? I'll read the first part, and if somebody has the line after it, if they could read it for me. It says, knowing that we were not redeemed with corruptible things. What are corruptible things anyway, by the way? I mean, it's an easy question. Anything secular, money, silver, gold, anything like that is secular, as the first example that was right there. Right. Yeah, well, when the Bible talks about corruptible things, things that corrupt mean that they will deteriorate, you know, that they're not going to be, they're not going to last forever. So uh, knowing that we are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Does anybody have the next, the next one? So there we have it. It's, it's not it by any of these, but the precious blood of Christ. Thank you, sister. I appreciate you reading that. Okay. Um, so yeah, what, what was the, the price for our salvation? Uh, it was the price of the Son of God, right? Being paid for us. What, I mean, can you think of anything more that somebody could possibly give? You know, no. No. Uh, the Bible says, greater love has no man than this, than a man lay his life down for a friend, right? Go ahead, sister. Absolutely. Yeah, this is not the first of God, and this is what he's asking for, and so what? But it, it points up, it brings us back to what is really, truly important in life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Worthless things like gold, this is not what God is all about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, at least, at least not in this life. Yeah. Because we know that he, it's not those things that are valuable, because in heaven, it, we abundantly... Um, okay, how does Isaiah's approach to salvation compare with that of the New Testament? So we're looking at Isaiah's approach uh, um, of what we're reading here, and then uh, we're comparing it to Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Um, and if somebody would like to read it, feel free. If not, I'll go ahead and just read it briefly. And I love this, this, this especially Ephesians. Yeah, any, any, anybody have it? Okay, go ahead, brother. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Amen. For we are God's handiwork, I like this part, mm -hmm. created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And I would read that, but does that tell you? You must accept God's gift of righteousness before you can do good works. Yes. That's right. And so forth. When you have confidence that God has saved you, now you're prepared to go out and share the gospel with others. Mm -hmm. Not until. Amen. That's how I read that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we know that the, the first step, as, as you said, is justification. Yeah. In other words, accepting the fact that we are justified through Christ. Go ahead, sister. Yeah, thank you, brother.
That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, as the lesson's telling us, you know, uh, there was no old covenant salvation by works. Uh, you know, we did a study on Romans back, uh, I think it was this year, earlier in the, no, it was last year. And, uh, you know, the problem that the Jews were having were this very same issue. You know, they were thinking old covenant, oh, it's salvation by works. And Paul was telling them, no, it's, you know, uh, faith in Christ and Christ alone is the only way. And they couldn't grasp it because they were saying, well, so you're saying we don't have to do works. You know, and that's, it was just so confusing for them. And yes, and we even still have that today where people are still confused by these very things. You know, it's, it's not the works that we do. Yes, we, we are to do works, but it's not the works that gets us salvation. And that's the understanding a lot of times people just cannot grasp. You know, so yes, we do the works because we love the Lord. That's why we would serve Him, not by any other means other than because we love him. Um, okay, so the rest of it says uh, New Covenant, Old Covenant, same. It's always been the same. Ever since God's promise of a deliverer to Adam and Eve back in Genesis 3.15, uh, there's only been one way to salvation, by grace through faith, Ephesians 2.8. The free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, and here's Romans 23, uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Um, but that's the other thing I love about Romans. Romans puts it very plain. If you understand the basic concept of what Romans, and, and this is the basic concept, it is, uh, it is righteousness by faith, or justification, same thing, by faith through Christ and Christ alone. That's it. It puts it plain that there's no other way. It's just by Christ, salvation, that's it. There's no other way. Any other comments? Okay. Let's jump into Monday's lesson then. Uh, if I missed anything, feel free to point something out or, or if you have something that I didn't cover. Um, I'm just trying to move through here. Uh, so Monday, uh, the heading is High Thoughts and Ways. Uh, why does God say that... Uh, well, let's just take a look at it first. Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 9. Um... And I'm just going to read 8 through 9 just briefly. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Um, okay, so. Oh, no, no, that verse is kind of discouraging. You know, it says, emphasizing the separation of what God is and what we are, and you say, wow, how can I ever bridge that gap, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, well, when you think about it. But Christ has bridged it for us. Well, yeah, number one, how long has God been here? How much do you think God has, has, has known? He already knows everything, I mean, but I think at times maybe I could be wrong, but... You know, maybe when he tests us, he waits to see the results. Because I do think at times there are things, you know, one thing mainly that, that God, I guess ultimately he could control, but he doesn't. You know what the one thing I'm talking about? The one thing I'm talking about is, is the idea of uh, free will. So, you know, God cannot make somebody love somebody or make you love him because of that. Is he limited by that? No, not at all. I think that ultimately he could, but he chooses not to because of the whole great controversy, right? Of, of God proving that he is not a control, a person that controls people. But, um, so, yeah, so if you think about that, how could we com be compared with our thoughts? You know, God has been around forever. How long have we been around? That's like trying to say a baby can know the thoughts of, a, of the parent. 
There's no way that can happen, right? Or even a child, a young child, doesn't know nearly as much as their parent knows. So how much more greater God, right? Go ahead, sister. That's right. Amen. Uh, well, let's just back up just for a second with that. Uh, we do have the right to judge, but not to condemn. Because the Bible tells us to judge. It says, but judge ye righteously. And how do we judge righteously? Well, we should make sure that we're living a life in Christ before we start pointing the finger and trying to correct our brother. And when we do correct our brother, it should be out of love. But most of the time, like you said, we just point the finger. You know, you're doing this, you're doing that. The Bible says you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Yeah, well, you, the reason I said that is usually because when people say judge, it, it's not really judging, it's really condemning. So that's the difference, you know? So when we're pointing the finger, we're condemning somebody. Rather than judging, judging would be more of something done out of love to help correct your brother because you love him and you don't want to see him go down that road. Go ahead, brother. Well, you know, this thing about your thoughts are not my thoughts. And I'm thinking now, if you're in a courtroom and you have an attorney asking a question, and the attorney is trying to get the person to think that the attorney thing is the right thing. The judge will normally look at you and say, wait a minute, you're reading the witness. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're making an assumption that's not what he's saying, it's based upon what you think. Mm -hmm. So when we converse with God, it's probably all figurative. We look ab about what he wants us to do through our eyes and not his. Yeah. And that's very natural to do. It's mm -hmm. just another experience we have. Yeah. And so, you know, scholars will say you cannot corrupt yourself. Every time you pick up the Bible, try to put away your bias. Ask the Holy Spirit to take care of it. Do not trust it. If the Bible's saying a lot of things that you agree with, you may be twisting the truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, that's probably a good tell. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing, too, is we got to keep in mind that God knows every one of our thoughts. Do we really truly know his thoughts? No. We only know what he gives us, which is just a small, tiny, tiny thing of what we need. Yes, sister, go ahead. Jesus had a tendency towards his father. Towards his? Jesus' tendency was towards his father. Ah, yes. We were born with a tendency towards him. Yes. And I think that's the point. Yes. Uh, we're, we're drawn to Satan's way. He's drawn to God's way, and we yes. have to take that. Good Amen. Life. Amen. Good point. Yeah, no doubt. Okay. Um, uh, let's see what else the lesson tells us before we move to the next part here. It says, uh, there's no question that God who created, us, who created a universe in which even some of the simplest things contain mysteries that our minds cannot begin to fathom is a God whose ways are beyond what we can never begin to fully grasp. I like that. Because when you think about the understanding that we have, even the, the, the most intelligent person uh, on the planet currently, you know, um, if you think about how much they really know, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, a, let's say a doctor, for example. People think they know everything. No, that's why they have specialists. They, they know certain parts of things, you know. So think of like microbiology, if you're going to like study plants, how much information in one little tiny plant we don't even know about. Um, okay, somebody else have a comment? Okay, so uh, the rest of it says, uh, 
This knowledge of his infinite sim uh, superiority should therefore make it easier for us to humbly receive his help. And I like that. You know, it should humble us in knowing how much we don't know and how much he does know. Um, okay. Uh, what's the context in which the Lord talks about how his ways and thoughts are higher than what we can imagine? What is he saying he does that is so hard for us to grasp? So verses 6 through 9, if somebody would like to read those, uh, feel free. Uh, Isaiah 55, verses 6, 6 through 9. So it's at the beginning, which I didn't get to yet. That's why I skipped it. Any takers? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways or way, and let the unrighteous man, his thoughts, let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Um, and by the way, that word pardon I like because uh, what is pardon really? It, it, it means excuse, right? To excuse. You know, like sometimes people say, oh, pardon me, <laughs> excuse me. You know, so abundantly pardon, excuse us. Um, so, any comments? I'm going to go ahead and read the bottom if there isn't. And then we're going to move on to Tuesdays. Uh, yes, yes. Good point. Yeah, we know that, uh, that once God gets rid of that sin for us that he no longer remembers it. Uh, uh, unless. Yeah, the, unless. Unless. The books. Well, it, it, it was uh, Mark Gunter who, who did Last Away with Better Marriage. Um, he, he, he makes a statement. It's, it's not like God sits there and says, you know, there's something about you that really ticks me off that I just can't remember. No, he, yeah. it's not like God has right. actually forgotten. Right. Yeah, amen. Yeah, uh, washes it away with the blood of Christ, right? The sins are just washed away. Um, yeah, I like that. Okay, uh, so all of, the, of all the great mysteries of the universe, no doubt the greatest one of all is the plan of salvation. Of course, we know that uh, the Bible tells us uh, that uh, Ellen G. White writes a lot about it also, telling us that, uh, that we'll be learning about this throughout the ages. Throughout eternity, the plan of salvation, how hard is it really to grasp? It, 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 it's seemingly, course. what's that? It's a never-ending course. That's right, that's right. Something that the angels look at, the Bible says, that desire to look at it up and try and understand. Um, let's see. Uh, so the plan of salvation, uh, we can only barely be able to understand. Uh, Ephesians six nineteen. Uh, let's see if we have that. Ephesians 6, 19. And for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. So there's one of the scriptures that tells us about the mystery of the gospel. Um, I'm going to read the last part of it, of the lesson study here. It says, the subject is inexhaustible. The study of the incarnation of Christ, his atoning sacrifice, and mediatorial work will employ the mind of the diligent students as long as time shall last and looking to heaven with its unnumbered years he will exclaim great is the mystery of godliness and that's Ellen G. White's writings as I mentioned Ellen G. White uh, in the book My Life Today uh, I'm going to read the bottom uh, I didn't read it on, on the last one uh, because I, sometimes they're, they're really good things to consider and try to understand it says Look at the bad things you have done, the people whom you have hurt, the unkind words you have spoken, the ways in which you have disappointed others, not to mention yourself. And yet, through Jesus, you can be forgiven for all these things and stand right now perfect and righteous in the sight of God. If that isn't a mystery, what is, right? I like that. And uh, yeah, I, I, I fit right into that category myself, even today. Unfortunately. Um, okay, any other comment? Okay, let's go to Tuesday's lesson. And Tuesday's lesson is fast friends. Fast friends. Uh, let me see, I might add just one more thing here. Let me see. Uh, 
Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, Ellen G. White mentions the theme of redemption is one that the angels desire to look into. It will be the science and the song of the redeemed throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. I like this part also, she writes. Uh, as we thus contemplate heavenly themes, our faith, our love will grow stronger and our prayers will be more and more acceptable to God because they will be mixed with faith and love. They will be intelligent and fervent. Um, so that's what it could lead to if we do what, what God is asking. Um, okay, fast friends. Uh, so Isaiah 58, verse 3. Would somebody like to read that? Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm going to read it also. Mine's just, it, it's pretty much the same, but just a little bit different wording. It says, why have we fasted? So the people are asking the question to God, correct? Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls, and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of our fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. So this is God talking to them, telling them, that, you know, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure. Uh, what was that word, pleasure? Uh, the, the word pleasure in that, I think, was trans, could be translated to work. Because if you look at the text after, it says, and exploit all your laborers, right? So, um, I'm going to read the beginning. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read it uh, before that, and then we're going to talk about what we had just read with that part, okay? And the beginning reads, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice, or lift your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did not righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Okay. So, um, it's asking us about the rest of it also. Um, I guess uh, I'm not going to read the rest just yet. Actually, let me just read one more verse here. Uh, so, after four, after when we read and you exploit your laborers, it says, Indeed, you fast for strife and debate, and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day, to make your voice heard on high, is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a burl, uh, a, a burl rush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Six reads, is this not the fast that I have chosen? I'm going to go ahead and keep reading. It says, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke I'm not going to go further because it's going to continue on into the next study. So I'm going to leave it there for a moment. Um, and the question asked here when it, it says, read through Isaiah, what are the acts of God considered true acts of self-denial? So I just read it. I'll go over it again if we need to, though. And it says, after all, what's harder, to skip a few meals or to use your own time and money to feed the homeless in your town? So yeah, that's what God is saying, you know, because here they were fasting and asking God these questions you know, they said, uh, why have we fasted and, and you have not seen? Uh, you take no notice. Um, and then God says, in the day that you fast, you find your pleasure and expo exploit, your, exploit your laborers. But then he goes on to tell them, because the question here is, is asking, you know, what is the fast that God is talking about? What is God saying? What is God telling them that they need to do? I'm going to read it again, the part that we're, we're looking at here. Just so I can keep from having butter fingers. Okay, one more time. 
uh, so again, um, he says, uh, is this not the fast that I have chosen? And here we go, he says, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring your house, the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh? This is what God is talking about. So what's he really saying, you know? Go ahead, sister. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, go ahead, brother. I think oh, you're first. Uh, when I was a, when I was a child, uh, my dad would have the whole family fast every Sabbath for periods of time, and I hated it. And I hated the Sabbath. And it wasn't because we were trying to be closer to God. It was because he felt that this was a religious thing and he needed to fill some religious requirement. Mm -hmm. And he was cruel and exacting in how he dealt with religion or the family. I, I shared it before when I was 14, he went to prison for two years of child abuse mm -hmm. to, to explain how extreme it was. Mm -hmm. So I grew up resisting fasting, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, amen. And you said it. The idea behind this, really behind the fast, is not that I'm trying to show God. And this was the problem with the people that he was calling out. This is the whole issue that's going on here. He's calling them out, basically telling them, your fasting is just an outward show of piety. There's no heart thing and connection with me there, as you said. And that's what it really boils down to is the reason that you're doing it is that you're being selfless and it's a self-sacrificing, not for any other reason, not for an outward thing. And, and we got to be careful because at times we may do this as Adventists too. You know, we have the health message. You know, we think that that is a way that we're closer to God by being obedient and doing these things and other things, of course. But no, as you said, it, it really is a, 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 a situation where we're, we're being selfless in what we really should be doing instead of just thinking about me because when you think about that oh i'm denying myself but really what it boils down to is that we should be out helping others because that's what god said right he says shouldn't you like be taking care of these issues you know of feeding people clothing them right go ahead sister Yeah, yeah, amen. We can miss the mark so easy. Yeah, Go ahead. That, that comes into a tit for tat thing. Well, if I do this, this, and yeah. this, God yeah. will give me this, this, yeah. and this. That's right. That's right. And, and, and what you're saying there is, is well, it, it, it's helping others. That is denying ourselves. 
because the whole point of of, of Satan sin everything is selfishness. That's right. What can I get for myself? And as soon as we look to what we can do for others, as uh, you know, not not to get political, but but an old Democrat president used to say, "Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask not what God can do for you." That's but right. That's right. Yeah, go ahead, brother. Yeah, yeah, amen. Uh, I, I want to just throw a real quick comment, and just a brief comment. You know, I was watching uh, some years back um, a religious channel, and uh, there was a Catholic priest that had come on, and uh, he was probably a bishop or something, I don't remember exactly, but uh, he was talking about loneliness, and he said, uh, you know, there's a cure to loneliness. If you're lonely, and very lonely, he says, all you have to do is go out and find people in need and start helping them. He said, you'll never be lonely. And I like that, you know, and it was powerful. Um, somebody else have a comment? No. Okay. So uh, the, uh, the rest of the lesson study says here, I'm just going to read through it. So, yeah, that was the issue they were having here in this whole thing that we're looking at is that God wasn't accepting their fast because they had gotten it wrong. It was really something completely different, you know, it was really that he wanted them to be selfless and help others, not me, look at me, right, because they turned it completely around. Anyone can be religious, anyone can go through a religious rituals, even the right rituals at the right time with all the right formulas, but that alone is not what the Lord wants. Look at the life of Jesus, perfect example, right? What did Jesus do the whole time he was here? It wasn't ritual things, I mean, he did, granted, but the majority of them were what? Helping people, right? Ministering to others, healing, uh, uh, preaching the gospel. Um, says, however faithful he was uh, uh, to the religious rituals of his time, the gospel writers focused so much more on his acts of mercy, healing, feeding, and forgiveness to those in need than of his own faithfulness to ritual. The Lord seeks a church of people who will preach truth to the world, but what will better attract people to the truth is, or as it is in Jesus, strict adherence to dietary laws or willingness to help the hungry, or let me rephrase that again, strict adherence to dietary laws or a willingness to help the hungry. Strict rest on the Sabbath, or a willingness to spend your own time and energy helping those who are in need. And I like that because, unfortunately, uh, myself included, you know, at times we, we think, oh, great, potluck, let's go eat. After potluck, I'm going to go home and take a nice nap. <laughs> Did you see where I'm going with this? Um, and in all reality, you know, 
times past, you know, the idea was that, you know, this, this is not what God wants. I believe that God wants me to go out and seek, first and foremost, I would say, family members in need of the gospel, in need of Jesus. You know, I think that's really what God would like. And not saying that we all, because not all of us can go out and do this, but at the same time, we can find ways. If it's just picking up the phone and calling somebody that you love that you know is in need, right? In any way, shape, or form. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that you're trying to preach to them. But Christ's method was actually, well, you know Christ's method, the first thing that Christ would do to win souls when he would go out reaching souls? The very first thing that he would do would be minister to their needs, right? He would do something for them heal them, or whatever it was. And then there was a second part, but the third part was then after he would do that, after he gained their trust, because once he did that, he would gain their trust. And then after they, he gained their trust, he'd say, come follow me, right? Go ahead, sister. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. You know, I, I, I came across that some years back also, you know. I was like, wait a minute. You gave this guy a, a couple of dollars. What are you really doing for him? I mean, think about it. If you really want to reach souls, yeah, again, like Christ, do for them, but don't forget the last part. Preach Christ to them. If you get an opportunity, you know, it's great. Yeah, give them money. I'm not saying don't do that. Or give them food. Whatever it is you're going to give them, but don't leave out the biggest part of it, which would be, hey, how can I, now that I've got this guy's confidence, how can I preach Christ to him now? And that's really the bottom line is what we should be, because then, you know, the Bible says you feed him for a day, right? But if you give him that, absolutely, absolutely. Anything that you can do, I mean, even alone, if you think about it, you're already representing Christ and showing Christ, because Christ said if you do this, right? Which, by the way, when he said when you do this for the least, you know when Christ says that, when you do this, you've done it to me? One of the reasons that he says that is, you know, we always talk about omnipotent, we talk about omniscient, and we talk about omnipresence, but anybody ever heard of, uh, uh, what is it? It's, uh, give me one second, I may have wrote it down. Um, omnipathic, omnipathic. God is also omnipathic, which means that he feels the pain of everybody everybody's pain so that's why he says when you've done this you've done it to me um, I think we're just about out of time so go ahead with the comment brother Sure, yeah, that's great. Okay, uh, go ahead, sister. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to point, but... Yeah, it's one of the best things we could do with people is share a meal with them, right? Because then we get an opportunity to sit and talk with them also. Uh, who, was, who else had... Go ahead, brother.
Sure, sure. Trusted things that we know, right? Uh, go ahead, brother. Right. We need to do that as Christians. And so the issue is, well, how do I get to that point? Uh, you know, I want to do that, but how do I do it? How do I disciple? And so forth. That's a training issue. Jesus was teaching them how to do it. Okay, he says, you go to a house, and maybe I say, I'll well, throw you out. Stop your feet and leave. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, and so forth. He gave instruction on how to share and how to witness. Mm -hmm. Which I think if there's a lack in the church, that's where it's at. We need to be working on application, not theory. Amen. That's kind of the final rap. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I wish we had more time to talk uh, where we could really get to the, the, the real meat of it. Uh, the whole issue was really on the Sabbath day, or it was actually on the Sabbath that God was calling the, the, the Sabbath, which was the, uh, the Day of Atonement. And so I think we pretty much covered it, what we were talking about. So the bottom line is, is that it was not about self, it was about a selflessness. Let me just read the summary in closing just briefly. Just one more second here. Uh, in Isaiah 55 and 58, the prophet appeals to his people to give up their thoughts and ways and return to God, whose ideal for their happiness is so much higher than their own. He mercifully pardons and then insists that the pardoned be merciful in harmony with the spirit of the Day of Atonement and the Sabbath because the gift of God's forgiveness, if it is truly received, transforms the heart. Amen? All right, let me just close with a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful and thankful for these scriptures, Father, these, these words that are of such deep meaning and above all that are words of life and salvation, Father. We thank you for the time spent in your word. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to fellowship today, Father. Uh, we just ask that these, uh, these, these readings today and these studies, Lord, will bless us abundantly, Father, and that we will not just be only hearers of your word, as James says, but that we will go out and we will be doers of what we have learned today, Father. Thank you for the time spent with you, Lord. I just ask that we all leave here today blessed. Uh, I ask for blessings for our leaders today in our church services. And uh, I ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.